Isaiah chapter 36. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. We open the Bible as we open our hearts for you, Lord, to come as the great gardener and plant wonderful seeds within us this morning, seeds of your words that will, Lord, blossom and bring fruit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 36. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed or fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper field in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna, the scribe, Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king of the king of Assyria, What confidence is this? in that wherein thou trustest, I say. Sayest thou, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now of whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. Whereon if a man lean it will go into his hand and pierce it, so is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all the trust in him. But... If thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now therefore, give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria. I will give thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then will thou turn away the face of one of the captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And am I now come up against the Lord, against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language. We understand it. Speak not to us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, hath my master sent me to thy master and to speak to these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh said, stood, and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken now, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. Come out to me. Eat ye every man his vine, every one of his own fig tree. Drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of, my, out of my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joab the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Now, well, we, we come now in, this, in, in our study of, of Isaiah to the history of one of the greatest deliverances that God brought to save the Jewish people. This history is opening with the words in verse 1, now it came to pass. The Hebrew word here is hayah, and the root meaning of hayah means to fall. So you could look at this verse as saying, and it fell, or it could be viewed as, and it took them. Here was a terrible thing that happened to Israel. The land of Israel was, was, was being taken and conquered by the Assyrians. And it was not that the king of Hezekiah was doing something wrong 
when, when this great army came against the city of Jerusalem under siege. She was doing good things. Hezekiah was doing good things. Hezekiah was bringing the people back to God when he was surrounded by the Assyrians. The Assyrians had managed to stop the water that was flowing into Jerusalem. The Assyrians were, were choking off the life of the people of Jerusalem. And it happened so fast, and it was such a surprise that verse 1 gives us that message when it says, now it came to pass, now it fell to Hezekiah. Now all this took Hezekiah by surprise. And these words alone in verse 1, now it came to pass, it teach us that we should never feel in our lives so secure here on earth that we think we finally arrived, we're in a place of, of seclusion, we're in a place of peace and safety because at any moment we could experience the hayah of verse 1, the being taken by an unexpected hayah calamity of a hayah tragedy falling to us like happened in verse 1 to King Hezekiah and to Jerusalem. This was a shock to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, he didn't want any trouble with the Assyrians. He, he thought that he, he tried to make peace with the Assyrians when he gave to the king of Assyria all that the king of Assyria had asked for. There's a whole history that goes parallel to this uh, history here in Isaiah, which is in Kings. And one of the passages in King, 2 Kings 18.14, 1814 says, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to king of, the, of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. But in spite of that, the king of Assyria came up against Hezekiah. This shows us that the best posture that we can take in life is to keep up an expectation that trouble is heading our way. It's just around the corner. This is what the Bible promises for life upon earth when it says in 2 Timothy 3.12, 2 Timothy 3.12 3, says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. That's a promise that trouble is going to hayah. It's going to take us. It's going to fall to us. And we should expect it like it says in verse 1, now it came to pass. It was a really scary time for King Hezekiah and for the people of Jerusalem because the successes that Assyria had made are given to us in verse 1 when it says, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Assyria had taken all the fortified cities of Judah and after he took them, he either killed the Jews of those cities or he removed them. He removed some 200,000 Jews to other cities. That's the way that Assyria assured themselves that a conquered land was not going to regroup and fight against Assyria on another day. The Assyrians were ruthless people. We always think of how bad the Romans were because they crucified their enemies. It was not the Romans who were the first to use crucifixion. It was the Assyrians. When the Assyrians would conquer a city, the Assyrians took all the rulers, all the military rulers, all the administrative rulers, the people that were well known in the city, and they crucified them, and they would not allow their bodies to be buried, and they wanted all the city just to look at those rotting corpses. That was the Assyrians. The Syrians today are the descendants of the Assyrians. During the Six-Day War in Israel, all of the Israeli POW soldiers that returned home from Syria, every one of them was out of his mind. They were insane from the tortures that the Syrians did on them. And the king of Assyria now has sent a great army, nearly 200,000 men, to surround Jerusalem. And the spokesman for the army is this man named Rabshakeh. He comes out to speak to the Jews, and we have recorded in this chapter what he said. He spoke in the, the as it says here, the Jews' language. The, the word Hebrew for a language is not used in the Old Testament. It's all in the language of the Jews in the Old Testament is only spoken of as the Jews' language. It's only in the New Testament where, that, where, where the language is called Hebrew. Hebrew in the Old Testament referred to people, not a language. But what he said 
What this, this man said in the Jews' language, Rab Sheka, is, is described in the Bible as great swelling words in Jude 116. Jude 116 says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. This is Rab Sheka. He's using his mouth to speak great swelling words against God's people and against God. And his great swelling words were designed to frighten, to frighten God's people and cause God's people to abandon their confidences, their confidence in God. And so this is what our enemy does. This is what Satan does for us. He amplifies some trouble in our lives to frighten us. It frightens us with something terrible is going to happen to us, which most of the time does not happen. But the devil puts the fear in us of what's going to happen. And all the while, Satan's goal is to frighten us out of trusting God. And that's what this man is doing here. Satan does this because Satan knows that if a person turns away from trusting God, that that person forfeits his protection from God. And so with this meticulous skill, the enemy now attacks three confidences here in this chapter that God's people might have had. And he starts by asking a question in verse 4. Verse 4, what confidence is this whereon thou trustest? This is what Satan does with us. When trouble and a great trouble comes to us in our lives, at that time, Satan just wants us to fold and surrender to him, to do what Job's wife encouraged Job to do in Job 2.9, Job 2.9, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain that integrity? Curse God and die. Be done with it, Job's wife said. Job's wife was telling Job that if he would, it would just be so much easier for him if he would just give up Commit suicide, which is what Satan wants. Satan wants people in trouble to think that it can be all over so quickly. A pull of a trigger, it's done. All the while, Satan knows that the pull of a trigger is going to send that person into an eternity of unmentionable sufferings in hell. So in order to get a person to just surrender, give up to the king of death, all trust, all confidence, has to be eroded, has to be stripped off. So Rav Sheka asked this question in verse 4. Verse 4, what confidence is this whereon that wherein thou trusteth? He has challenged God's people by telling them that their confidence and trust was nothing more than empty words. In verse 5, verse 5, I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain, empty words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? First, Rabshakeh attacked the first confidence that Israel might have, which is a trust in Egypt. In verse 6, verse 6, Lo, thou trustest on the staff of that broken reed on Egypt, wherein if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. Rabshakeh knew that Israel had made a military alliance with Egypt, and Egypt was famous for their chariots and their horsemen, and that's what Rabshakeh taunted Israel with. The chariots, the horsemen of Egypt, in verse 9, verse 9, how then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Rabshakeh was referring to what happened to another people, the people of Ekron. Ekron knew that Assyria was going to attack them. So Ekron sent for Egypt to help them, and Egypt did send a large force of chariots and horsemen, and this same Sennacherib slaughtered all the Egyptians, destroyed all the chariots. This is what Rabshakeh is telling Israel, that Egypt was a broken reed, that looked on the outside as though it was strong, that a person could put weight on this, uh, on this reed, that it, would, but that, that it would hold him. But Reb Shekhar would say, no, it's going to break. That reed's going to break when you put weight on it in such a way it's going to form a, a sharp point that's going to go right into a person's hand and pierce it. This is what Reb Shekhar is talking about in verse 6. 
for us, what this means, trusting in Egypt, is symbolic for us of trusting in another person instead of trusting in God for help in time of trouble. Trusting in Egypt symbolizes for us substituting a trust in a human friendship in the place of a trust in God. It's amazing how strong the language is in the Bible on this subject of trusting on, in a human friendship instead of trusting in God. The Bible is very forceful when it says in Jeremiah 17, 5, Jeremiah 17, 5, thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Those are very strong words. Cursed to describe a person who trusts in another person instead of trusting in God. The problem with replacing friendship with God with friendship with man is that man is sinful. And sin plus sin equals sin. The problem with leaning on man instead of leaning on God is that man is not reliable because human friendships break down. Sometimes human friendship breaks down into treachery. Treachery is the word that God uses to describe divorce in Malachi 2.16. Malachi 2.16. Speaking about divorce, or as God puts it, putting away, it says in Malachi 2.16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. Sometimes human friendship, human friendship breaks down through a moral or a spiritual fall when a person falls into sin. Sometimes human friendship breaks down through the abandonment, the feeling of abandonment, could death, a fr friend dies, there's a feeling of abandonment. Human friendship cannot take the place of friendship with God. Human trust cannot take the place of trust in God. Trusting in Egypt instead of trusting in God represents for us trusting in man instead of trusting in God. And what God is saying in Jeremiah 17.5, Jeremiah 17.5 is woe to the person that makes man his trust instead of God his trust. That person will find that only God is reliable and that man will not be reliable to trust in. That man will be like a reed that will fracture when weight is put on it, and when it fractures, it's going to become a sharp javelin and pierce right through the hand that was trying to put weight on it. This is what Rabshakeh was saying in verse 6. Now, God had used a very familiar phrase to describe trusting in Egypt when God warned Israel, don't do it, don't trust in Egypt, in Isaiah 30, verse 2, we have seen this already, Isaiah 30, verse 2, when God said, they that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt, therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. That phrase that's used twice in Isaiah 32 and 33, 30, 30 verse 2 and 30 verse 3, is trust in the shadow of Egypt. The picture is of a person in the desert who desperately needs protection from the sun, desperately needs shade, and the person needs a shadow that he can get under to protect him from the sun. And God says to Israel, it's so wrong to trust in the shadow of Egypt. The Assyrian army is like the sun that was beating down relentlessly on Egypt. And Egypt was in desperate need for a shadow, a protection from the heat that the Assyrians were putting on them. And God told Israel in Isaiah 30, verse 2, Isaiah 30, verse 2, don't trust in the shadow of Egypt. Right now, Israel is under the beating sun of, of as, the, <clears throat> as the, uh, the chief of the defense, Galan, said, seven fronts that are attacking Israel now, from Hamas to Lebanon to the Houthis to Iraq to Iran to Syria, and many nations 
that are amassing against Israel, including South Africa. South Africa has filed a lawsuit in the International Court of The Hague accusing Israel of mass murder genocide in the Gazans. Israel needs a shadow from Hamas, from Iran, and from all the nations of the world. But instead of trusting in God, Israel is again trusting under the shadow of another nation, the United States. And unfortunately, the United States will become for Israel what Egypt became for Israel in the past. Verse 6, verse 6, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Israel is starting to feel how the United States is like a broken reed that cannot be relied on as Israel has watched with great concern as the U.S. has pulled back its largest aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald Ford, and its attack ships that accompany that from the Mediterranean. Israel is starting to feel how the United States is like a broken reed that cannot be relied on as Israel's watching a growing amount of anti-Semitism where? In the U.S., especially on U.S. campuses. That's why God said in Isaiah 30, verse 2, Isaiah 30, verse 2 and 3, for Israel, do not trust in the shadow of Egypt to protect you. Instead of the shadow of Egypt, God encourages Israel to trust in the shadow of God, not the shadow of Egypt, but the shadow of God. Psalm 17, verse 8, Psalm 17, verse 8, keep me as the apple of thine eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. See, in that verse in Psalm 17, 8, Psalm 17, 8, God encourages a hiding under the shadow of God's wings. That's a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture is that of God as a protecting hen who spreads out wings and encourages the chicks, come, run under, hide under the protecting wings. This is what Jesus, as the king of Israel, as the protector of Israel, said that he wanted to do to protect Israel under his wings in Matthew 23, 37. Matthew 23, 37, when Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. That's a great tragedy. It's a great tragedy when Jehovah Jesus spreads out his protecting wings and invites a person to come and run under the protecting shadow of his wings and the person refuses and is left unprotected. God encourages a person to see the sweet kindness of God and trust in God when it says, when it says in Psalm 36, 7, Psalm 36, 7, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. That's why it's so important for us to live in this book, to live in this book, because the Bible is, in essence, a history of God's redemption of man. It's a, this is a history of God's salvation of man. And when we fill ourselves with the Bible, we fill ourselves with historical accounts, like this one here of the Assyrians, as we'll see, and we see just how loving God is to save us from fears, how kind God is to rescue us from troubles. And seeing this builds a confidence a confidence of Psalm 36, verse 7. Psalm 36, verse 7, put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. The Bible calls, the, calls that trust, that trusting in God in the shadow of God's wings as a secret. It's a secret place in Psalm 91, verse 1. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's a secret because the world only sees religion. They just see your religion. The world cannot see the secret place of the protecting shadow of trusting in God. All the world sees is that that's a person's personal beliefs. He's got a personal religion. But trusting God is not just during a time of trouble. Trusting God is not just at the time of jumping into a foxhole, Psalm 91.1, Psalm 91.1 uses two words that to describe how trusting God is a life. Trusting God is a constant occupation of an all the time. 
trusting in God. And the two words that tell us that in Psalm 91, one, Psalm 91, one are he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Those two words, dwelleth and abide. In Psalm 91, one, God is saying that to be in the secret place of under the shadow of God, of the Most High, is to live there. To live in the secret place of the Most High is where a person would say, I live in the secret place, place with Jehovah Jesus. That means to be in a constant state of communication by prayer with Jehovah Jesus, secretly. That means to be in a constant state of secretly trusting Jehovah Jesus for everything in life. And for that person, God says that the person will always be under the protective shadow of God, which means that God will always have his protective wings over that person. That's what's meant in Psalm 91, verse 1. Psalm 91, verse 1. Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And a person who is there, a person who is under the shadow of the Almighty is a person who has found rest, and peace in his soul. As Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. A person who's come to Jesus to have a life of constantly being in that secret place, with that secret communication with Jesus is a person who's found rest, is a person who's found peace in life, and he's been freed from the turmoil and the restlessness described in Isaiah 57.20. Isaiah 57.20 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose, heart, whose, whose water is cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. And a person who makes another human his trust, instead of God, forfeits it all. He forfeits the rest. He forfeits the peace. And that only comes from making God his trust and confidence. And Rabshakeh is nothing more than a puppet controlled by Satan. And Satan's first strategy with us is to attack our confidence in another person instead of God. And his argument is true which is that in the time of our deepest needs, when we need someone to lean on to support us, the arm of flesh will fail us. The next strategy of Satan in our lives is seen in verse 7. Verse 7. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah taken away and said to Judah in Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. What, what Satan does next is to attack our confidence in God. Rabshakeh knew that Hezekiah had destroyed the altars of God that were built outside of Jerusalem. Hezekiah was right to have done that because God said throughout the book of Deuteronomy, he kept referring to a place that I shall choose, a place that I shall choose, a place that I shall choose. For example, Deuteronomy 12.11, Deuteronomy 12.11, there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose, to cause his name to dwell there. Thither you shall bring all that I command you, burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithes, seeth offerings of your hand, your choice vows, which you vow unto the Lord. The place that the Lord chose was Jerusalem. Yet Israel had built these other altars for convenience outside of Jerusalem. Those were the altars that Hezekiah had destroyed. And Rabshakeh falsely claimed that Hezekiah had offended God when Hezekiah destroyed those altars outside of Jerusalem. This is one of Satan's strategies, which is to make us think that the trouble we are experiencing in life is <clears throat> only because God is mad at us. God is angry with us because somehow we offended God. The truth was that God was not offended by Hezekiah and God was not angry with Hezekiah. Now, the next step that Rabshakeh took to destroy confidence and trust in God is when Rabshakeh said in verses eight, verse 18, verse 18, beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying the Lord will deliver us. Have, have any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? 
And then he goes on and he names gods. Where are the gods of Hamath, of our father, the gods of Sepharim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? What Rabshakeh was doing here was to say, the Lord God, he's no stronger than any other gods of other nations. Rabshakeh went ahead and named some of those gods, Hamath, Arphad, and so forth. It's absurd to think that the Lord God has no greater power or ability than the gods of religion. That's why I hate the term Christianity. I won't use it. I don't like it. Because to refer to Christianity is to say that Christianity is one of the world's great religions on a par with the other of the world's great religions like Hinduism and Shintoism, animism and Islam. To use the term Christianity is to infer that the God of Christianity is like the gods of Hinduism and Shintoism, Islam and so forth. That's absurd. There is no such thing as Christianity. There's only truth and error. And error is that the other gods of the religions are just as powerful as the Lord God. And truth is, Isaiah 45, verse 6, Isaiah 45, verse 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. There is none else. Hosea 13.4, Hosea 13.4, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. There's no such thing as Christianity. There's only truth and error. There's only truthianity and error anity, whatever that is. And the truth is that the on, there's only one God who exists in three persons, and we know that God as the Lord Jesus Christ. And Rabshakeh said that the other gods were just as valid as the Lord God. And the other gods were not able to save from his hand. So the Lord God will not be able to save from his hand. That's what he's saying in verse 20. Verse 20. Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Rabshakeh ridicules trust in the Lord God as he imagines that Jehovah is only a God like the other gods, just like many gods. Reb Sheka has no idea that there's only one supreme God and Reb Sheka has forgotten something else, which is Isaiah 51, 13. Isaiah 51, 13. Forget us the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Rabshakeh has forgotten that the Lord made him and the Lord alone is the maker of heaven and earth and all things that are visible and invisible. Rabshakeh is ignorant of the fact that Jehovah Jesus is the God of John 1, 3, John 1, verse 3. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Rabshakeh is confused. Rabshakeh is wrong. But he's going to find out the truth. But when he does, it's going to be too late for him. And what Rabshakeh said, which is recorded in this chapter, has made Jehovah Jesus angry. And then the king of Assyria got very personal with the Jews, as he said in verse 16, verse 16, hearken not to, to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me and each and every one his vine, every one his fig tree, and every one the water of his own cistern. With that statement, the king of Assyria got in the face of God's people when he said in verse 16, make an agreement with me, come out to me, which is the same as saying, trust me personally, lean on me, follow me. Those words made a very personal challenge to God's people. It's the same as what Goliath said to David in 1 Samuel 17, 44, 1 Samuel 17, 44, the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the earth and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me 
with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou defiest. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I'll smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I'll give the, the carcasses of the host of Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. When Rav Shekha invited God's people to come to the king of Assyria, he promised them that it'll be good for you. It'll be very good. In verse 16, verse 16, he says, make an agreement. And he says, then you'll be able to eat your own grapes off of your vine. You'll be able to sit under the shadow of your fig tree. You'll be able to eat the figs. You'll drink from your own wells. And then he said in verse 17, in verse 17, he says, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, bread and vineyards. Rabshakeh was telling Israel that the king of Assyria was a kind man, and he would allow God's people to eat their own vines and, drink, and drink, eat their own figs and drink the sweet water from their own wells. And Rabshakeh told them that it would be temporary, and then he'd get moved to a different place, not God's promised land, but the other would be very nice, nice with corn and wine and bread and vineyards. Lies, lies, lies. But those were the false promises that Rabshakeh made to God's people. And this is the strategy of Satan today. Satan puts within the minds of people, hell is not such a bad place, causes people to think that, Hell's not so bad. It's a place I'll be able to be there with my friends. But this is not God's description of hell. In Matthew 13, 42, Matthew 13, 42, he says, but shall cast them into a furnace of fire where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9, 44, Mark 9, 44, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So, We've seen how Rav Shekha has attacked two of the confidences or trusts that God's people might lean on, which is trust in other humans, as in trust in Egypt, and trust in the Lord God. And now Rav Shekha turns to the last trust or the confidence that God's people might lean on when he says in verse 8, verse 8, give pledges, I pray thee to my master, the king of Assyria, I'll give you 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to to put riders on them. How then are you going to turn away the, one of the captains? Another trust that will fail a person is if he trusts in himself. This is a, he trusts in his own abilities to stand up, fight for himself. And this is what Rasheka is, is, is attacking now. Confidence in self in verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. If thou be able on thy part to set riders on them. What Reb Cheka was saying was, okay, so let's say that you're not going to trust in Egypt. Okay, let's say you're not going to trust in any other persons for help. Okay, let's say you're not going to rely on the Lord God for help. All you got left is yourself. All you got left is your own abilities to save you. And if that's the case, he's saying, I'll give you 2,000 horses and for you to put riders on them and let's see if you can do it. Rav Shekhar knew that Israel did not have a cavalry uh, of, of horse riders, and that's why he challenged Israel by saying that you don't even have riders to put on these 2,000 horses. That was a direct challenge to Israel on self-confidence, on trusting in self. And God always says, that's very foolish for a person to trust in himself. That's included in the curse of Jeremiah 17, 5. Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh, a, 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 maketh flesh his arm whose heart departs from the Lord God. Just like the, uh, just like the song says, you, uh, you dare not trust your own. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Okay. So, now, to further frighten God's people, Rab Shekha says something very offensive very offensive in verse 12. Verse 12, Reb Shekha says that my, he says that he, he sent me to the men that sit on the wall. They may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you. That was designed to make Israel angry, to say that Israel, you'll be eating and drinking your own ways. Very offensive. 
And we can imagine how tempting it was for Israel to hurl back some insults to the Assyrians. But as tempting as it was to fight back with equally offensive words, Israel's response wisely was verse 21. Verse 21, they held their peace and they answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was answer him not. King Hezekiah was a wise king when he told his people, don't answer the Assyrians. That was wise because the Bible says in Proverbs 26.4, Proverbs 26.4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. When we are personally offended, our first response and our inclination is fight back. But he, King Hezekiah knew that this was a battle between the Assyrians and God. And Hezekiah did not want his people to get in the way of that battle. When we're offended, God waits to see, you're going to hold your peace and let God step in? Or it's like God saying, well, which one of us is going to step into the battle? If you do, I won't. If you do not, I will. It's like a game of doubles in tennis. You yell, my ball? God steps aside and says, all yours. You yell, your ball? God steps in, takes the ball. And this is what makes these statements about the response of Jesus to his personal insults so precious to us. The statements about Jesus when he was personally offended are so precious. And the statements are Matthew 27, 12, Matthew 27, 12. When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Matthew 27, 14, Matthew 27, 14. He answered him to never a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly. Mark 14, 61, Mark 14, 61, he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, said to him, art thou the Christ, the son of the blessed? And so, as we come to the end of this chapter, which is really the beginning, though we're going to keep on going to other chapters in this history, we can see how the stage is set as they turn their eyes to God to come and fight for Israel and save them from the Assyrians. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you never let anyone down who turns to you in trust and you didn't hear in Jesus' name. Amen.